Be seated. It's always a joy and delight to have Brother Coleman with us. It's a wonderful work that the Independent Board is doing, and God has raised this man up to be a leader, to be the one who sort of is the head of organizing everything that goes on. And he's gifted him as a preacher, too. And so we're looking forward with real eagerness and anticipation to Reverend Keith Coleman. Brother Coleman, God bless. The Lord has seen fit in his providence to take two of our members of our board home, Dr. William Leroy, our former president and missionary to uh, Brazil for 37 years, uh, went home to be with him in March. And then one of the husbands of our board member, Mrs. Clark, Mariana Clark, went home to be with the Lord the next week. And then uh, Gordon McGregor, pastor, former pastor of the Northeast BP Church, our treasurer secretary for a couple of years, uh, was taken home to be with the Lord. So when you talk about transition, you know, we've, we've seen that. And uh, during my time at the office, I've seen the Lord uh, be pleased to take some of those brethren home. Uh, you miss them, but you recognize that's the life that God has given them. The transition is in part of it all. Before our Lord Jesus Christ's ascension, he had issued what we've come to know and appreciate as the Great Commission. A commission is a, an authoritative command, a directive. And Jesus spoke those words directly to his disciples, but also he spoke them indirectly to us. He was giving the church, as we often refer to it, as the church's marching orders and telling them exactly what he expected during his physical absence. Those passages we've become very familiar with in reading them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. The Lord Jesus Christ wanted us to go into the world to share the gospel of Christ. And as the disciples did, as they were convicted of that very thing, it was referred to them as they were ones who were turning the world upside down. Those disciples felt truly this was the Lord's command to us. But that is then and this is now. And what is given as the Great Commission has turned out, as some have labeled it, to be the Great Omission. Omitted. Something has been left out, something undone, something neglected. Instead of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, it's difficult, it seems, for the church to take the gospel to the ends of their own street. A few statistics to share with you. 95% of all Christians have never won a soul to Christ. And I say this just in the sense that we know that God is the one who wins. God is the one who works in our hearts. But as far as an individual saying that I participated in this, I did this, and I saw somebody come to Christ through my witness, 95% have never had that. 80% of all Christians do not consistently witness for Christ in one form or another. Less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. 2%. 71% do not give towards the financing of the Great Commission. The statistics are horrifying. The statistics show the pitiful condition of the state of the modern church. It would seem to say that we are satisfied with being saved, but we're not motivated to see others come to Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, as, as we have. Somehow we've come to believe that the end of our responsibility is coming to church a couple times a week, praying every so often, reading our Bibles when we have time, and living a life that is slightly cleaner than the world around us. We've settled for mediocrity. We've forgotten the truth that Christianity is militant. It's an activist faith. Our calling is not to endure to the end. Our calling is not to sit by and watch others go to hell. Our orders are to go into the world and tell them the glorious news of the crucified Savior that he is risen, who specializes in saving souls and changing lives for eternal destinies. Well, the church has pulled the covers of complacency and apathy over its head, fallen into a deep sleep of self-satisfaction, 
the world continues on a headlong plunge into hell. And we look at the news and we listen to see these things and say, well, that's the way it's going, but the church seems to sleep through it. The door of evangelism seems to slowly be closed in our own country, as witnessed, I'm sure, by many Sunday pieces of information your pastor has given you. I found out that there are many colleges and universities have closed in their door to evangelism, Christian evangelism on campus, simply because they don't want to have it. They don't want Christ preached there. And those who will allow Christian campus organizations Many will have them sign a pledge promising not to attempt to evangelize students on campus. Other things have changed as well. As most of us will ratify, 20 years ago in America, you could approach the door of a total stranger's house, knock on him, talk to him, and ask if I could come in and share something with you. And more than likely, they would open the door and welcome you in. Those days are past. Yet in spite of the conditions around us, in spite of the difficulties and dangers, in spite of every excuse that is being offered, the Great Commission still stands. God expects for his people to take that message into the lost world, for indeed it is our Lord's command. Has the Great Commission become a great omission? In my life, in the life of our church, we want to look at that this morning. I have four points to share with you, and it begins with our verse 19 of our scripture. Our Lord says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. First of all, brethren, there is a mandate. There is a mandate, and it is to what? To go. To go. It's a word of action. We can't go if we're still sitting. We can't go if we're still staying in the place that we have been. We cannot go if we don't attempt to make a move. The verb actually means as you go. As we pass through this world, we are to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's basically two forms of where that takes place. One by the way we live and the second by our own speech. You've read the verses in Matthew 5 when it talks about we are to be the salt and light in this world. Like salt, we are to create a thirst for people, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our joy, our peace, our differences from the world should cause them to want to know what makes the difference in you, what makes you different from me and others around. Our life should be a great spotlight that directs it's beam towards Jesus Christ. And if he is the focus of our lives, men will see him throughout our day, after day, after day. But it also includes the matter of our speech. He says, go ye therefore and teach. The idea of making disciples, of instructing. We are to live a right life, but we're also to share our faith. We're also to speak those things which are upon our hearts. We're to tell the lost world that Jesus had died to save them and that he has promised that all who would believe would receive him. Mark 16, 15, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach! A herald to proclaim! That's what the world means. Like a king's herald, we are to pass through the highways and byways of life with our voices declaring the grace of God to those around us. The word preach is a command, one in which we are to carry out all the time. But in truth, we are preaching all the time. We are proclaiming one thing or another. Every moment of our lives, we are preaching through our actions and through our words, either pointing people to Christ or pointing them away from him. He is my Savior and my Lord, and you need to know him, or my relationship to Jesus Christ really doesn't make a difference in my life. That's the preaching that we do. As they see us, as they hear the words that we are saying, they're going to gain something of that relationship from us. Either he means very little or nothing, or he means all to me. And that's how people discern 
our relationship. Our duty is to tell. If the Lord just saved us to keep us from hell, he could have taken us to be home right as the moment we were saved. If the only purpose was to do that, we would have been gone from this earth a long time ago. If he had just saved us in order to worship him and praise him, then he would have taken us straight to glory. From the moment of my salvation, I would have been in his presence for all eternity to sing his praise, if that was the sole reason for my salvation. But he saved us so that we would have a story to tell. He leaves us here so that we can tell that story of what he has done in our lives and the changes that he has made. He saved us to use us in this world as a tool of his ministry to preach to lost sinners. D.L. Moody was attending a convention in Indianapolis on mass evangelism. He went and he asked his song leader, Ira Sankey, to come out with him before the meeting and go on a street corner. He put a box down, asked Sankey to sing. The crowds gathered. Moody stood up and he started to preach for a while. And then he stopped. And he told the people to come into the convention hall. Soon the auditorium was filled with spiritually hungry people. And the great evangelist preached to them. Then... The convention delegates began to arrive, and Moody stopped preaching, and he said, Now we must close. As the brethren of the convention wish to come and discuss the topic, how to reach the masses. We could talk about it. We can discuss it. But it is the action that God has given us in his command to bring forth something to do about it. We have a mandate from our Lord. Secondly, out of verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. We not only have a mandate, but we have a message. We have a glorious message. Jesus tells his followers to share a specific message, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. As we go into this world to tell the world about Jesus, the message we share is the clarity of the gospel. Jesus came into this world to make the gospel a reality, not a theory. He came into this world to die on the cross, to rise from the dead, and open a way of eternal salvation for all who would receive him. Jesus came to this world as the Savior of men. He came in to make a way for lost sinners to be reconciled to God. And he achieved every single purpose that he came into this world for. Our message is not to declare our church. It's not to declare our denomination. It's not to talk about our preacher or about the standards of dress or about our music, although all of those things may have profit. It is a message that we are to bring that will save a lost soul from hell. Our message is simple. To hope for hurting people. To bring life to the dead. Peace to the tormented. A message that it is the gospel, the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is a message that every person in the world needs to hear. It is the message of universal application. It is a message that there is a potential change in every life that falls under its power. We've experienced that in our own lives. For I've delivered unto you, first of all, that which I was also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Sharing the gospel message is as easy as telling people what Christ did. It's easy as sharing the same things that we've come to know and appreciate in our hearts and our heads, but they need to hear it. That's it. It is a powerful message that the world, the most powerful that the world has ever heard, and that must be delivered to a lost world. There is no other message that God can use to draw sinners to himself but the gospel. He will use that to save souls. 
Well, thirdly, we also have a mission. Back from verse 19 once again. What's the difference, though, between a mandate and a mission? I often thought about that. But a mandate, for clarification's sake, is forever, and a mission is for now. He's given us a mandate, but the mission that we have is for now. He says, go and teach all nations, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Acts 1, 8. But ye have received power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He was telling very clearly that our mission is to every person in the world, that our mission field is the entire world. He may call some to fellowship to leave this country and reach certain people groups, he did so for Mary McNeil, for Dorothy and Earl White, and others. But of course, he may just ask us to send our money to support those whom he's called to reach in the other parts of the world. But it is indeed a mission for us. While he may never call you to the foreign field to tell the story of salvation, he does expect you to tell him where you live. He expects us to tell all people, without any regard to their ethnic heritage, to their race, to their past, to their lifestyle, to their economic station in life. If they are sinners, they are candidates to hear this message. They are lost and they need a savior. They do not know him. They need to know him and have been authorized and commanded to reach them is our mission. How are we going to reach the world around us? Are we active in our Jerusalem? Have we considered our Samaria and Judea? Surely the other most parts of the world. Are we fulfilling our great commission or are we guilty of committing the great omission? Fourth one, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you and lo, I am with you always even until the end of the world. Amen. We finally have a mentor. We have a teacher. We have a guide. We have a counselor. Jesus just does not send us into the world, a lost world, without resources. He doesn't expect us to accomplish the Great Commission in our own power. In effect, he gives us in these verses the greatest power, the greatest source of resources, it's in himself. He says, Lo, I am with you always. He has promised to be with us. When you're standing there sharing the gospel with a friend, that family member, that total stranger, he says, I'm there with you. I'm there leading you and guiding you and assisting you in this very thing. He'll help and he'll enable, he'll embolden you and use you simply to obey him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. He will help you to say what you need to say and to be a witness for the opportunity itself. But when they deliver you up, take no thought of how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour that what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Obviously, the passage is talking about being arrested for your faith. When that happens, he'll give you the words to speak. And it may be closer than we think. It may be closer than we think. He's also promised to empower us. All power in heaven and on earth is given unto me. He also says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. When the faithful share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that message, we can be confident that God will use it by his power to bring those feeble words to the hearts of those he intends to receive. The Spirit of God will take our efforts and he will use those words to convict the hearts of the lost. I'm not a powerful witness. I'm not a stunning testimony. 
that I will faithfully share what the Lord has done in my life. I can't draw many around to hear what I've got to say, but these things are the things that I know in my heart that God has done for me, and I'd like to share them with you. I'd like to bring them to your heart's attention. And God will use our weak message to draw sinners to himself for the Savior. Again, from the life of D.L. Moody, he had made a covenant with God one time and said that he would witness for the Lord Jesus Christ at least once every single day of his born-again life. One night about 10 o'clock he realized that he had not witnessed to somebody and he went out, out to the street corner, spoke to a man who was standing by a lamppost and he asked him, he says, are you a Christian? Well, the man flew into a violent rage and he threatened to knock Moody into the gutter. Well, later on, that same man went to the elders of the church and he complained and he says, this Moody guy is doing more harm for the gospel than all of the enemies were doing. The elder begged Moody to temper his zeal with knowledge. Three months later, Moody was awakened by a knock as he was staying at a YMCA. He opened the door and the man said, I want to talk to you about my soul. It was the man that he had witnessed to three months earlier. He apologized for the way he had treated Moody and said that he had no peace ever since that night on Lake Street when Moody had witnessed to him. Moody led the man to Christ and became a zealous Sunday school worker in his church. Amen. The power of what the example in Jesus Christ and what he has promised becomes rather evident as we see the gospel not only proclaimed but witness to. Under a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks are often occurring, there was a once little life-saving station. Building was rather primitive. They only had one little boat. The members of this life-saving station were committed, though, to keep a constant watch over the sea. When a ship went down, they unselfishly went out day and night to the lost saving them because there were so many that needed to be saved and they became famous. Well, consequently, because they were famous, others wanted to join this little association, this station. And they brought in their time and their talents and their money to support this important work. New lifeboats were bought. New men were recruited. Formal training sessions were offered. And as the membership in this life-saving station grew, some of the members were unhappy with the building itself and the facility. So they equipped that which was outdated. They wanted a better place to welcome survivors in when they pulled them out of the sea, so they replaced the emergency cots with beds, better furniture, decorated the room. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for new members. They met regularly when they did, and it was apparent that they loved each other tremendously. They greeted each other with hugs and shared what each other has done in the events of their lives. But fewer members were now interested in going out to the sea to save those on the ship. So they hired lifeboat crews to do this for them. About the same time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought into action the saving station lifeboats. They're cold and wet and dirty and sick and half-drowned people were brought in. They had accents that were unfamiliar to them. Their skins were black or yellow or whatever. And they brought them in from first-class stations to even the deckhands. Well, the beautiful meeting house became a place of chaos. The plush carpets got dirty. Some of the exquisite furnishings became cracked and scratched. So the property committee immediately had a shower built outside for shipwrecked victims so they could be cleaned off before they were brought into the station. At the next meeting, there was a rift amongst the membership. Most of the members wanted to stop this club's life-saving activities, for they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal fellowship of the membership. Other members insisted that the 
Life-saving work was the primary purpose for them meeting. He pointed out that there are still life-saving actions necessary each and every day. So they could go out and their life-saving station would go down to the coast, and if they didn't have it, then what? What would happen to those people? So they moved down and they opened up a new station. As years passed, this new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a place of regular meetings of fellowship, for committees, for special training sessions about their mission, but few went out to the drowning people. The drowning people were no longer welcome into that new life-saving station, so another life-saving station was founded down the coast, and history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of adequate meeting places with ample parking and plush carpeting. Shipwrecks are frequently in those waters and people are still drowning. The parable of the condition of the modern church, not to hurt people's feelings, but this is just what's taken place. As we drive down our roads, we find life-saving stations abandoned. Examples of what was a zeal and a hard uh, a hard-fought condition for the Church of Jesus Christ of years gone by. But the Great Commission had become a great omission. No longer were they seriously considering the condition of lost souls, but they became stations of fellowship and mutual interest. Great omission or great commission. The Lord Jesus Christ has called us, called us, mandated us, given us a mission, given us an example by himself, allowed us to be able to serve him in such a fashion. Foreign missions, we say, well, that's a different story, but it's not. How foreign do we have to go? How foreign do we have to go to another block or another state or another Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria? The condition is the same. Brethren, the commission is given for us. We don't have to be great speakers. We don't have to be great witnesses. But we do have to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ to tell others what he has done for me. Our time is short, not only on our clock, but in our life. What things has the Lord done for us to change, bring us salvation? There is a lost and dying world around us that needs to hear this very thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in the brevity of this life there is great clarity when it comes to the gospel. That if we are born again, if we have received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have been saved in order that we might serve. For Lord, you have ordained not the, the angels of heaven to proclaim this message. You haven't ordained that the, the clouds would order out the words of salvation, but you've given them in your word, in your book, and you've brought them to the reality in our own hearts and lives in order that we might speak, in order that we might live, in order that we might be people whose hearts and lives will affect the lives of others. Father, cause us not to be afraid, but cause us to be emboldened to proclaim the glorious message of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, that we begin right in our own Jerusalem, that we begin in our own backyard. We pray for those family members that we love that are still without Christ. Give us the ability to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, to share with them that which is such a joy for us, and that they may see in us a difference what Christ has done for us. Help us, Father, also to participate in the, the opportunity to support missions locally and in foreign fields where with great clarity we see your hand moving. Our time is short, Father, as indeed we recognize the condition of the world that we live in and your word is proclaimed as such. May, Father, we do our best for one day we will stand before you and must give an account of what we have done. May we hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. May that be your word for us. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Coleman. A tremendous uh, challenge. Uh, each one of us needs to remember we are part of a life-saving station. And that is one of the great things that we're supposed to be doing, is reaching the lost. You know, uh, Brother Coleman uh, gave a, uh, a message that ended with a nautical uh, illustration. And our closing hymn today is a nautical illustration. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to In Times Like These, you need an anchor, and be sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. There may be somebody here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ. You know, Christ died for your sins, for all of them. Think about your sins for a minute. All of us have got sin in our life. There's only one who can save you from your sins. He's the only one who died for them. He gave his life for you. He went out to rescue you so that you could live. He died in your place. He bore your sins. He rose from the dead to prove that his offer of salvation is true. Today, make that the day that you accept his offer. Trust him. He'll give you eternal life. Trust in Jesus. Jesus alone can save you. Let's turn to 577. Let's stand and sing all three verses. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these 